Yeah, good day, everyone, and welcome back to the Tripod Punting Show. My name is Dane from Clarkie's Rugby League Column, here to steer this program and give you a holistic view with my own analysis game by game. And I'm joined every week by the Tripod founder, the CEO of this network, and the man who always has a plan with nine years straight of consecutive winning years when betting on the NRL. It's the same person, believe it or not. It's the great Winnie. How are you going, my friend? Good, thanks, mate. I've got an idea to throw straight at you. How, how many... Followers have you got on Instagram currently? 118,000. 118,000. What about this? It's pretty radical, but bear with me. Every week you put 10 cents on for every follower, <laughs> 10 cents on the Titans head-to-head. So this week would be, what, 11 grand on the Titans head. I just think that idea could catch on if you're willing to, you know, shake things up with me. We, you know, we got to do something. We're in a little bit of a rut with the best bets. Mate, there are plenty of Instagram pages floating around that are doing that at the moment, whether it's a blackjack per day or a roulette per day or whatever it might be. Um, but I will have to get some financial advice before I can commit to that one, unfortunately. Uh, look, maybe if it was the Panthers I'd be in, but, yeah, you really got to think about it when it's the Titans. Uh, but mate, look, been... Our show is not uh, financial advice, but it is punting advice, and I try to give my favourite tips to the round and hope that in the long run we're going to do well. You went to Vegas. You returned. Uh, for the recap show, you gave us some of your highlights then, but welcome back again and uh, happy birthday for the weekend. But, mate, when you left, best bet record was nine and four. The last two weeks, I think I've gone two and five, which brings us to 11 and nine, as it shows on the screen there. I read every comment. I read every private message, for better or worse. There's people out there that are genuinely angry at me. And uh, I, to a degree, I say, look, bad runs happen. But I take the feedback on, on board. I try to get better. What I have to guarantee is that uh, you can't guarantee a bounce back. Uh, but I also can tell you, you don't have to play every best bet, just the ones you agree with. I've got four to share in round six. And I don't know if people are going to love them, but here we go. Should we, should we roll straight into them? Mate, shoot. Okay, I'm going. The Dolphins on Friday night, plus the 10.5 in the Battle of Brisbane. That's at $1.90 on better. I know Brisbane is the stronger side, but when I look at Reynolds being out, even though understanding Walsh was named today, I uh, feel like Brisbane's biggest strength last year was the front row. That's a, They don't have that same front row anymore. It just brings the Finns a little bit closer, along with the Derby factor and the fact that, in a way, this is Bennett's grand final. I think that double-digit points is just a little too much for my top-of-the-table fins. The following day, I thought pretty simple handicap for the Warriors, minus 5.5 at $1.90, toppy and better, because I just believe they're the stronger side than the Manly Seagulls. Uh, Garrick out, which is a loss, and then goal-kicking. You've got to have to roll with DCE. I feel like yeah, you score one more try, it's likely you're going to win by a converted try. And I think the Warriors win by at least that much. And I know it's a super strong home advantage at Mount Smart. Some people might not give New Zealand too much credit for destroying South Sydney because of their woes. But a soft kill can do a world of good and give you a lot of confidence. I think the Warriors are on a roll. I thought that line was cheap. I'm going to go against South Sydney again. Maybe I should have just done the same last week. And as we know, you should have done that every week for the last 12 regular season rounds. Well, it's not too late. Let's take the Cronulla Sharks. And I think I can back that right now in front of everyone's eyes because it is $1.82 on Dabble. And that is minus seven and a half. And I'm even going to plug in, yeah, I'll plug in Warriors. I'll plug in Dolphins. Let's back them all. Uh, and you can copy me right there. And for me... Cronulla's off a bye, Nikora's back, maybe Hamlin Wele, uh, Rudolph I saw. It does seem like total desperation when I look at South's lineup. We'll address that, but Cookie's dropped. Uh, who else? The Talis Duncan can't make this team, right? And we knew that Latrell would be suspended. So it's like now my halves is uh, my spines, Mamazoulis and Gray and Hawkins. Uh, it's last chance saloon for Jason Demetrio. If, if the bunnies rip in, that's a decently sized line, seven and a half points. It won't be a cakewalk to cover that. But what if the team's not playing for Demetrio anymore? Kind of like I said last week. And that's why last week was a missed opportunity. And I don't want to chase. You don't want to play something because you wish you'd played it seven days earlier. But I believe it's a similar situational spot that I'll get a shark side that is going to give me my money's worth. And even if the bunnies play hard, 
I just don't think they're all that capable right now. We could still win. And if the Bunnies are con- continue to be a mess, that could be the easiest win of the lot of these. And what's probably not going to be an easy win, but I'm brave enough to take it, is your Gold Coast Titans on Sunday night. I'm taking the 10 and a half start in the nation's capital. Could be some capital punishment for me. I think there's enough there with the Titans. You know, now that Jason Campbell's back in his team, Fafita's back in his team, there were some signs of life up in North Queensland. I really don't want to detract from Canberra because that's a strong side that's really surging right now. But it's still the same team that couldn't beat anybody by double digits last year. I'm not willing to say that they're a completely different side this year because they've had a couple of more lopsided victories. I think there's every chance that one could be tighter and it could be the least popular pick on the entire board which might make it the best. Mate, it is uh, some great best bets there, and we look forward to getting your analysis further on each game as we go through um, game by game. Before we do so, just a shout-out to everyone. This is a live show. It's great to see so many familiar faces. We've got Jeremy. Um, I can see Colt from YouTube. Um, on Instagram, we've got the Back Yourself podcast. It's great to see so many familiar faces, and if you are new here, chat to us throughout the show. We will see every comment that rolls up. I'll see them either side of my head. If I'm doing this throughout the show, it's because I'm reading your comments. Um, so we will get to all of our games in just a moment. Before we get there, let's get the final word on the results from round five from a bookie's perspective and find out how these team lists have impacted round six with the CEO of Top Sport, Tristan Merlihan. Get everyone, it's Tristan Merlihan here from Top Sport, back for another round where there's been a few movements in a few of the games and obviously the Roosters um, got, a, got a number of players hurt on the weekend. There's been a big move in that market. We uh, the, the, the Roosters were picking before the weekend uh, or even favourites, I believe, but... Um, when we opened the market, it was three and a half. It shifted out to five and a half on the back of all the outs. And uh, Greg Marzoom potentially being named back in the side. The Storm had gone from 17 and a half out to 19 and a half. Uh, and then the other game that's seen a bit of movement has been the Sharks against the Rabbits. Obviously, plenty been made about the coach. That game has moved from six and a half to eight and a half. So very strong money for the Sharks to win that game quite comfortably, which could have some big ramifications. All the other games have been pretty solid. Obviously, uh, the Broncos as well. With um, with Reese Walsh being named back in that side, that's seen a little bit of movement, nine and a half out to ten and a half, but uh, not too much there because there's a little bit of doubt over a few of the other players. But um, an interesting weekend coming up. Last weekend, the the worst result for us by some margin was the Melbourne Broncos game. We thought we we're in a good sh- uh, shot there at half time when the Broncos had the lead, but then Melbourne came back and won the game. We actually laid a good chunk on the plus and also all the multis into the head to head. So that split was pretty pretty ugly. Uh, from our point of view, though, the best result was Manly against Penrith, which uh, there was a bit of money in the marketplace for Manly, but we managed to dodge that and laid a bit of Penrith late. So up and down weekend. It was a good good weekend of football as usual and looking forward to seeing what happens this weekend. Good if you have uh, good luck if you're having a punt on the weekend and, of course, gamble responsibly. Awesome stuff, How about Beth. that shirt, Clarky? I can see you looking down as well. Are you sneakily getting on a couple of these best bets? Well, Potentially, I uh, was getting on some of our best bets in a responsible manner, of course. But, mate, what about that shirt from Tristan? It, where is he? Hawaii or something? He, he, he is It looks like it. Thing. So the shirt tells you a story that the bookies uh, did all right last weekend. And if people were playing my best bets, unfortunately, that would be the case. And I think Tristan might have been feeling himself too after the mixed matchup was in a tenuous position. But then the Canberra Raiders put a 40-piece uh, on the Eels, which which hurt a lot, and I talked about that in the recap, but smashed a best bet, a mixed matchup, and a same game are all out of the water. So out of the water. I've uh, I've licked my wounds a little bit, and as, is, as I said, I've shared my four plays, and now we get a chance to deep dive a little more game by game. Absolutely. Thank you very much to Tristan there, who uh, Keegan says that's crossed live to him uh, in some exotic place in Maui, I believe. But... Uh, Love it. Let's jump into Thursday night. It's the Knights v Roosters. We're at McDonald Jones Stadium, and the line is set at minus four and a half in the Knights' favour. No changes to this Knights' lineup, but Greg Marzu is in reserves and is a chance to be included late for the Roosters. Some huge changes. Stay with me. Teddy is out, so Manu moves to fullback. Sam Walker is out, so Connor Watson joins Luke Keary in the halves. Dominic Young suspended. Junior Ponga comes onto that wing, and Zach Docker Clay is their new utility on the bench. Now, Winnie, the Knights have won eight of their past night at McDonald Jones with their only loss at home since round 16 last year, being the Raiders in round one this year. Uh, but ironically, the side that did beat them last was the Roosters uh, at home way back in round 16 last year. It was by two points. It was a close one. How do you see it playing out this time? 
And I had the Knights in that game as well. And the Knights were under a converted try favourite and should have won. The Roosters absolutely pinched that game. And then the Knights went on to, as you said, be absolutely dominant, uh, not just home, but home and away to end the last season. And apart from that blip in round one, again, they're a tough team to beat at McDonald Jones. Uh, we'll give you some credit. You messaged me. When was it? Would have been Thursday or Friday night? Uh, yeah. Was it when the Roosters were sustaining those injuries? I think it must yes. have been during Roosters' during Bulldogs. The game. And you said nights to 240 against the Roosters next week was still available, you know, and, uh, and it's the exact reverse odds. So you can basically say now that the line has moved eight points on the back of no Teddy, no Sam Walker, and also the two results, Roosters' loss, and then uh, the Knights were impressive getting that win. Frizzell is still out, but Lucas was one of their best on ground on Friday night. As you say, Marzu may come in. Uh, the Knights have been really solid this year, and then you you know that not many teams do get the better of them at home, as we said. The Roosters clearly have these big names out, but we always talk about the depth they possess. And again, you know, Robbo knows better than me, but you still got Egan Butcher, Sia Wong, can't even crack the 17. Uh, You've got Connor Watson been chosen at 5'8", certainly a versatile player, though he wouldn't have played in the halves in, in a while. I know Kiri can steer the team at 7. It's funny because people have been writing Kiri off and we all acknowledge he's past his prime. But if you watch that game against the Dogs, it was actually vintage Kiri in the second half when the Chooks mounted that most unlikely comeback. They scored four tries in 20 minutes when they were one or two men short. And Kiri looked like uh, he'd wound back the clock. And that was with no starting halfback or fullback. Manu is as good as Teddy as a fullback at the fullback position as far as I'm concerned. But you can't say it's no loss because you've now lost Manu essentially at centre. In saying all that, I could still only play the Roosters. And I know people will laugh because I always seem to love the Roosters. But that line's probably swung a bit too far for me. I, I feel that it's a really even match I look at the team like similar level benches and I know the Roosters have a more credentialed forward pack but the Knights are a little bit younger which isn't necessarily a bad thing both teams have got newish halves combinations that both change their halves for different reasons they both got some strike in the outside backs I'm still you know a big fan of Swali but Bradman Best can be damaging of course look like look at the superstars they've each got at fullback but then you'd have to give the edge to Newcastle being at home and just in this more consistent rhythm that they kind of know what they what they want to do and how they want to play. While the Roosters will be sure they'll be determined. And you've got two weeks ago costing the game falling 14-0 down to Penrith having to chase. And, of course, last week, same story, 26-0. So, if anything, you're looking for the Roosters to explode out of the blocks in this one. But you can't expect everything to click with new parts in, in key positions. Had this line got all the way to six, I would probably have to take the Chooks. But at four and a half, it would be a lean. However, it would be a pass. So I was actually looking there while you're speaking. Connor Watson, 124 NRL games, only started at 5'8 on uh, 34 occasions. So he's very versatile. But I right. also feel they were more at the, earlier in his career. I agree with that. They, they yep. definitely feel like it, that is the case. Uh, look, I'll look at this game and I go straight to the Roosters' spine. Now it's missing Sam Walker and James Tedesco. I don't really view Brandon Smith in the light of a game manager. So the responsibility here does fall on Luke Keary, which could be dangerous given, you know, some of his concerns with concussions in the past, et cetera. And whilst he was brilliant last week, it's definitely an easier competition there um, in the Bulldogs who really just somehow let go of a, a firm grip on that game. For the Knights, though, it is a similar story in terms of the responsibility and the spine falling onto one player. And in this case, it's Kalen Ponga. If I'm trying to split these sides... Based on that, I have to prefer Kalen Ponga, given he leads the Dally M and his recent form. I also think at stages here, the Roosters have just put themselves under completely unnecessary pressure. Um, they started so poorly against the uh, Bulldogs and then almost made a comeback. Um, against the Panthers, they almost made a comeback, but there was moments that they put themselves under pressure. And there was another game earlier this year, mate. I can't remember the exact one. It might have been the Seagulls game where they yes. just threw it from there and half. Yeah, and just completely unnecessary movements. Um, you know, despite that, when I looked at the errors and the set completions between these two sides, it doesn't differ to a great degree. Where I could find an edge was what you said. It's the Knights forward pack. Now, they are averaging almost 100 more metres post-contact than the Roosters. Um, it's also the second most of any side this year. So the Knights, like you said, they got some young forwards, but they're definitely stepping up. And if the Knights forward pack does win that battle, 
that we know Kalen Ponga would do his thing. Even in the wet last week, he was involved in two tries and four line breaks. So he will definitely uh, be active in this one. What's your final tip or prediction here? I know you said that the Roosters will be focused and start well. Do you lean towards maybe giving them a start with a first half plus line at all? Yeah, absolutely. You could do that. Um, you, you'd you easily get a plus two and a half and it wouldn't be a bad way to play the Roosters. And I'm close, but I, I kind of feel like you could let that see what the market does and could the line climb to six anywhere. And then I, I prefer a plus six to a two and a half uh, for half a game. Uh, but ultimately, if you're going to press me for kind of a game prediction, I'll say I'll say the Knights will, will sneak at home and it'll be tough and a grinding style game and maybe Newcastle wins it by two to four points. Great call there. The Roosters have a great record against the Knights. They've actually, the Knights have lost 12 of their last 14 to the Roosters. They had that one win and then the next one comes all the way back in 2014. So it's been a really poor stretch, but despite this, I believe they're going to turn their fortunes and get the job done here on Thursday night. We move to Friday night, 6 p.m. It's the Storm v. Bulldogs. We're at Amy Park in Melbourne, and the line is set at minus 18.5 for the Melbourne Storm, who will be without Jack Howarth. He has been dropped for Tepai Maroa. For the Bulldogs, big changes again. Blake Taft, concussion unavailable. That moves Stephen Crichton to fullback, Jacob Carraz to centre, and fortunate for the Bulldogs, Josh Adokar returns on the wing there. Kurt Mann's out, so Salmon is the lock again. Josh Curran gets to start at back row for the first time this year, and Bailey Hayward will debut via the bench. Winnie, I'm sure you remember last year, round two, Bulldogs go to Amy Park after losing by 25 points in round one to the Seagulls, and they pick up a huge win there. Now, this line, I believe the largest of 2024, suggests it's unlikely to occur consecutively. Uh, Do you agree with the market on this one? Yeah, I definitely remember last year, 26-0, that same score. That was the halftime lead Canterbury held last week against the Roosters, and it was the lead they built at Amy Park, as you said, in one of the surprise early upsets of last season. And Canterbury, of course, went on to win that game more convincingly than they had to cling on last week. But I feel like that's a factor massively in the Storm's favour because the Dogs are undermanned, although I really want to examine how undermanned are Canterbury this week. Because we, we knew the story, the carnage coming out of that uh, Roosters game. But the team lists have kind of surprised me. So I'll get to that. But as you say, Canterbury are the biggest underdogs of the season right now. What you have going for you when you play like a three-try underdog is could, could the home favourite overlook this team? You know, could you take the opponent a bit lightly? And as opposed to you're just not amped up full full throttle when you know you probably don't need to be. But considering that the dogs are off a win, and that the Dogs embarrassed the Storm last time they met at this venue, I think you get a Storm side that's dialed in. On top of that, yes, Melbourne won last week, but conceded 32 points and not going to be happy with that. My instinct was, hey, it's the highest line of the season, but maybe we just got to lay it. Melbourne's going to win this game and going to win well, right? But I do have reasons uh, why I'm not playing the this uh, massive number. I mean... Look, uh, I, I think Nelson will get picked. I think he'll get his first opportunity. That That's actually further in, in the Storm's favour, I would suggest, because, you know, he'll, um, he'll want to make a case to get his, his himself back in the side. But you've got comments from Cameron Munster that he's just not 100% all year. So it's like, how can you be completely confident that he's definitely going to play? Because they keep talking about this issue. It's not just when he's running that the groin's affecting him, but he can pull up sore unexpectedly. So you can, Munster could be out at any day. Uh, and that, that's concerning that you, one of your very best players says he's, he's limited. Uh, and the other part of it is that in my mind, it's a completely battered, bruised, beat up, undermanned Bulldog side going down to Melbourne. But the lineup's not that bad. Like Crichton at fullback could, you know, is a superstar that could be unleashed. You get out of car back. So your back line's still got the likes of Kiraz, Cherry. Like Tracy, they said he had a torn calf, but he's there. So that's mm. one thing I'm confusing me. So obviously it's what? It's a strain. Um, I know that these outside backs for Canterbury are going to be asked a lot defensively, but they're pretty good players. You've got the same six, seven, nine as last as all year so far for Canterbury. Like none of those players were injured. Uh, and I look at the forward pack. Yes, the dogs get a little thin, but my kick out. I thought he had a fibula fracture, obviously cleared. King was meant to have a fractured hand. He's named Patolo. So are all these guys playing? Uh, that's my question. If they are, 
this line's actually too high. That that Bulldog side's a, a first grade side that's going down there and um, not getting any respect in the marketplace. Having said that, I don't think I could play the dogs right now when maybe they just didn't want to reveal the, the extent of their losses yet, and they've they've named some players who could be withdrawn in the, in subsequent days. So. I would probably wait because I feel like I, I take the 18 and a half and then you find out, yeah, sure enough, actually, Kikau's no good and, and Tracy's no good. So that's the issue. You can make the counter argument that if you take the dogs now and Munster is ruled out, it will the line will shift three points. But uh, I'd be worried that this, the team list does not seem to correlate to what was reported uh, prior. So that that's how I'm reading it. But I'm not going to be shocked at all if I see the storm roll, I thought Melbourne looked really sharp in attack against Brisbane and I'll expect more of the same, but I definitely think Melbourne's defence will be a lot better and, of course, the dogs don't pose the same threat as Brisbane. Uh, what it comes down to for me, though, is getting lines up this high and if it was to creep into the 20s, like that's usually reserved for bottom four sides and usually more common later in the year when you've got teams that kind of know they can't make finals and sometimes let go of the rope in games. I mean, the Dogs have won, like, a couple of games this year, right? Or Yeah, they've won, like, two games, and and it's only round six. Uh, I I don't see why the Dogs shouldn't fight in this one. And and that second-half scare last week could do them good because they won't be complacent about the fact that they beat the Roosters. So there's enough reasons to give Canterbury a little bit of hope. Probably not the shock upset of last season, but make a game of it is still possible. I look at that Bulldog side and I just wonder, now I went to their website while you were speaking and they've still not released the scan results for Chris Patolo, Viliami Kikau or Connor Tracy. So I would have to assume all three are in doubt. Like you can't have a suspected yes. break in your leg and a suspected torn calf and a suspected shoulder injury and suddenly be okay a few days later. To have those symptoms, you'd think it's at least something serious, like some bone swelling there or something for Kikau. Uh, Max King, the scans did reveal a fractured hand for him. Now, he might play through that or he might be removed closer to kickoff. So I'm not sure what Bulldogs lineup we're actually going to get here. Um, and it goes back to our conversation a few rounds ago where we just wished there was no funny business around the lineup. What we get is, is what we, you know, uh, what's we're actually going to see on game day, barring any last minute changes. I don't think I need to delve too deep into why I prefer the Storm here. The market is a, a fair indicator of that on its own. But to add a little bit to it, the Bulldogs have been horrible on the road lately. They have only won one of their past 10 away games, and that was a one-point victory against an understrength Dolphins side in Bundaberg on a Sunday Arvo. Very different conditions to Melbourne on a Friday night. Uh, the Bulldogs only won three away games flat out last year, whereas the Storm are extremely formidable at home. They have won their past 12 straight at Amy Park. They are three from three there this year, and ironically, their last loss at Amy Park was the Doggies last year in round two. Now, they did lose in Melbourne at Marvel to the Panthers, uh, but if we're only looking at Amy Park, we go back to round two in that shock doggies loss. The Storm, if I'm looking for something they're not doing quite well this year, it's only completing at 75%, but I'm going to put that down to the changes they've had in their halves. Now their usual halves are back and maybe not at full fitness, but certainly, you know, Jerome Hughes is firing there. I expect that number to rise. I expect they'll complete significantly better this week and really pile the pressure up on the doggies. So I'll go to you for final prediction. Do you look at something like Storm to win both halves if you're confident they'll get the job done? Do you look at an option for a multi-leg here or is nothing really jumping out at all? I mean, Storm to win both halves is still going to be $1.40, $1.50. Too right? uh, look, what I'd play would would be dictated by what the news filters out to be uh, later in the week. But someone else, others have speculated, like Colt says, that Serato could still make mass changes and what i will say as well is that this market's definitely factoring in that the doggies are more depleted so you'd love the line to be like 14 and a half or something because the dogs are still named closer to full strength or as close as they possibly conceivably could be and then you you what you would want to do is bet against a team that has a lot of doubtful players and then hope that some of them come out but it feels like it's already very much uh baked in ryan says but critter has a good record against the storm yeah critter has a good record against everybody because he played his whole career for the panthers uh up until this season so i wouldn't read a great deal into that but i can't wait to see him uh do his thing at fullback i I do admit that much 
Yeah, and that's one of those stats. Like, if I told you that Ricky Stewart's only won six of his 25 games against Des Hasler, you're probably not going to tip the Titans this round. It's a stat, but we can't read into that one too much. Hey, I wish I knew that one. would have added to my best bet even more. <laughs> uh, we've got some mixed opinions coming in here. Back Yourself Podcast says, look, Bulldogs lost 6-0 to 11 players in the final, sevens la uh, final seven minutes last week. So it sounds like he's not keen there. But I did see Jeremy from Facebook. He said, Bulldogs first half plus eight and a half is $1.91 on bet 365. And he's happy to think they can hold on for more than 39 minutes. Uh, for me, my final say here is storm by a big margin. Not sure about the line, but a big margin. I just think this is a bridge too far for a Bulldogs side that uh, is continuing to improve, but isn't quite there yet. All right, Friday night prime time. It is the Broncos v. Dolphins. We're at Suncorp Stadium, and the line is set at minus nine and a half against the Broncos. Big changes for the Broncos. Reese Walsh is back, so that moves Tristan Saylor to the bench. Adam Reynolds is out, so Jock Madden comes in at halfback. Corey Oates returns, a fan favorite there because Dean Mariner is out. Payne Haas is still sidelined. Xavier Willison returns on their bench. For the Dolphins, Thomas Flegler is still named despite the shoulder injury. Herbie Farmworth is out, so that moves Tessie New to center. Felice Carfusi is out, so Kenny Bromwich starts at back row. And Jared Wallace joins the interchange, as does Anthony Milford. Now, Winnie, it is the first place Dolphins, which would have surprised a lot of people if you told me they were first after six rounds. They're up against their arch rivals, who currently sit outside the top eight in 11th. Despite their ladder placings, the market here favors the Broncos, but you are pretty keen on your fins in this one. Uh, how do you break this one down for us? That's right. You're not often you get top of the league playing 11th, but the top of the table is getting 10 and a half points. However, mm. it's early in the year. You know, having an early season buy helps a little bit. Brisbane's had some tough assignments so far. Uh, it's a shame we don't get a full strength battle of Brisbane. Not getting Herbie against his former club or Flegler. Well, sorry, Flegler is playing, but uh, has a shoulder issue as well. But for me, I still kind of think about it compared to last year and go, well, it's still better than Herbie and Flegler playing for Brisbane. You know, at least they're not on that side. And I still maintain Brisbane's not as good this year as they were last year. And of course, they won't be in this game without Reynolds uh, or Haas, but Walsh. And, and Walsh is tough and Walsh won't uh, hold back, I'm sure. And he was like, wearing the protective gear and straight into training as soon as, as physically possible. Now, speaking of Broncos training, there was a report that Mam limped off the park and suffered a little scare, but I haven't heard anything further. So that would be a tiny factor that could play into your favour taking the uh, Dolphins start, but the greater likelihood that said is that uh, Ezra Mam should be good to go. Uh, yeah, it goes back to uh, Brisbane can't dominate the game as much without the best front rowers available to them. And of course, without the kicking game of Reynolds, uh, you've got the Dolphins that are playing really well, have done a lot right this year. And it goes back to the fact that when we think of Brisbane, when they've been at their dominant best, it was always from bullying teams. And then the, the spine could and the backs could uh, play off the back of that. But it's a totally different starting front row and Piakura is out as well. Uh, it definitely brings the game closer to me, I know Kafusi is also out and Bromwich has probably been dropped for a reason, but it's not a bad, no, he's not a bad player to bring in either for a derby game. Uh, am I a little bit frightened? Of course, of Reese Walsh is so, you know, he, he will rip in and he could rip the fins apart. I, I know that. I know, but at least the Dolphins do have uh, their own superstar at fullback. And, and man was absolutely electrifying. I, I don't think I made the point in the recap, but like, it was reminiscent of the grand final almost uh, Thursday night in Melbourne in terms of what man was doing. He had the game of his life, but uh, just on the wrong side of the result yet again. And in this one, maybe Brisbane does get the result, but here's my final point. Bennett took over the Finns. He's got him into the comp. He's launched them. Season one, great success, right? And Bennett is moving on at the end of this year and was never going to coach the Dolphins for many seasons. So it was never... Wayne Bennett was never going to lead the Dolphins to a premiership in his tenure. But this is the Dolphins' premiership. This is the white whale to beat Big Brother. They got close in one game last year at Suncorp. They've got a chance in this one. I know that Bennett can get a team up for an occasion, and that was enough to me to say there's reasons why Brisbane could really play well and there's reasons to fear Brisbane, so I don't want to make it look like I'm dismissing the Broncos and going against them uh, all the time. But... You can't knock the Finns too much either. Ten and a half is a solid start for a derby. 
Uh, I think they can go close to potentially beating Big Brother in this one. And I love this matchup. I think especially at Suncorp Stadium, it just adds another layer to this. You know, it adds intensity and excitement. I believe this is a game that both sides will be up for emotionally, absolutely. You know, on one side of the coin, as you touched on, we have Wayne Bennett, who his resume speaks for itself in terms of getting sides up for the occasion. Need I remind Blues fans about the worst ever Queensland Maroon side in 2020? Or how about the Dolphins inaugural game last year against the Roosters? The list goes on of the times he's got his side up mentally for a game that they probably shouldn't have won. On the other hand, Kevin Walters is a coach that I've spoken really highly of this year in regards to his ability to light that fire under his side in the Broncos and have them up for the big occasions, despite the fact they haven't really been full strength for many games this year. For mine, I believe the Broncos have shown me more in their last three. The Panthers' loss, it was disappointing, but I do think there is genuine excuses in that game. They responded brilliantly at Suncorp against the Red Hot Cowboys, and I don't think they were too poor last week in a loss to the Storm. Whereas for the Dolphins' last three, yes, they smoked the Titans, uh, they smoked the Dragons and edged past the Tigers, but the strength of schedule there doesn't quite add up to the Broncos for me. Now, you can take that one of two ways winning. Could that lead to extra burnout for the Broncos? Or does it read that their form is higher than what their record currently suggests sitting in 11th? I'm not quite sure. But the Dolphins have had more wins. They completed a higher rate. They score more points. They average less missed tackles in the, um, of anyone in the competition, actually. And I do think all of those stats, whilst they are great, they're heightened due to that lower level of competition that they've faced so far this year. So it's going to be a really interesting game, mate. Uh, so your final thoughts on this one, your Dolphins plus 10 and a half. Anything else that you like in this one? Uh, look, I couldn't endorse Colt's comment there, Herbie ATS, unless it's <laughs> any time shoulder injury, uh, fortunately. It's not going to be the case. Uh, no, just I, I don't like to take a kind of a big start unless I think a team has a chance to win. But the Finns certainly do. And you talked about games where Bennett can get his team up, and that includes the first time these sides met, which was about round four last year. And the Dolphins led like by eight or ten points in that game. And it took a length of the field a kind of breakaway I against guess. runner play, Coney Stag to Tony Stag's try to seal the deal for Brisbane. And and, and I know that they uh, made it clear that that was their house and they certainly want to maintain that. And Brisbane's not going to let the Dolphins get that first win uh, easily by any stretch. Like, I'm not looking to fade Brisbane here because I think it's a big spot. And it's going to be a big crowd and uh, it's going to be an exciting one. But there's enough reasons for me that the Finns will be in the fight. Yeah, definitely a big crowd. I reckon it'll be a sellout. And that game last year where the Dolphins did lose, they were so up for that game emotionally because I think they had two or three injuries throughout it as well. Like, there was genuine excuses for them there. Uh, for me, I'm just going to tip the Broncos head to head here. I think they will turn up for the occasion just like the Dolphins will. I like their ball movement against the Storm. I'm not sure if that ball movement will be the same, but we did still see it in the second half. Uh, I expect Jesse Arthurs to be the beneficiary of that uh, on that left wing there. Now, he scored a try last week, and then he bombed another. So I think he will. He's actually crossed in every game this year so far when he besides the Las Vegas opener. So I like him for a try there as well. Saturday afternoon, Warriors v Seagulls were at Go Media Stadium in New Zealand and the line is set at minus 5.5 and 5 .5 against the Warriors. For the Warriors, Dallin Watani's Lesniak comes back, so Adam Pompey drops out. Kurt Capewell returns, but Bunty Arfoa is out with a hamstring injury. Manly have a few changes as well. As well. Ben Trevojevic moves to centre, Corey Waddell to back row, and Ethan Bullimore joins their bench. We're in New Zealand for this one, where the Warriors have won six of their past seven and Manly have not won in New Zealand since 2017, Winnie. Uh, and you believe that the Warriors will continue that impressive form across the ditch in this one? Yeah, the Warriors are cruising for me. As much as, okay, Souths are a mess, sure. And, and so do people dismiss that, like, how impressive New Zealand looked on Saturday? I spoke about it in the open. Like, that soft kill, it does wonders for you. It doesn't take too much out of you, but you get that nice tune-up. And New Zealand's brimming with confidence right now. And CNK came back, and uh, they haven't lost much in Metcalf being out. I thought Tamari Martin also was excellent in the halves alongside Johnson, who looks as good. I question whether he could possibly meet the levels of uh, 2023. So far, early returns are great. Like Johnson, the game's just slowed down for him. So there's a lot to like about New Zealand. And then the thing about Manly is I don't really want to knock them, and that they're also coming off a quality victory. But... As I discussed in the recap, I think you've got to put a bit of that win over Penrith down to, right, let's let's never forget that Nathan Cleary was out. 
uh, but also the occasion, like it was DC's record-breaking game, it was rookie. Like, it, it makes sense that you get up, and it was against the triple uh, premiers. It makes sense that you get up for a game like that, but that doesn't mean that's your standard that you can uh, sustain every single week. So can Manly really bottle that level up and take it on the road? That's a different story. Is anyone going to disagree with me that man, that the Warriors are the better team? That's how I see it. And I also see Mount Smart as a home advantage worth up to four points. And in daytime conditions, it's pretty straightforward to me. Like the line should be above six, but it's under six. So I take New Zealand. Me, for me rather, I thought this uh, line should be minus eight and a half when, when these games, that's what I was expecting. And I was on the fence um, thinking about who I would prefer there. But look, I get, I get the same feeling as you. I think there's a real uh, sense of false confidence around Manly at the moment. In my mind, a win against an understrength Panther side where they got a few calls go their way on one of the biggest occasions in their club's history at home, everything in their favour, right? It doesn't undo the two previous poor weeks against the Eels where they blew a lead and the Dragons where they were in it, but, you know, not as much as they would have liked to have been. And then you look through their whole season so far and really outside of round two against the Roosters uh, and last round against the Panthers, they haven't been all that impressive this year. Um, you know, they still conceded 26 points to a Rabbitohs side that didn't look like scoring against the Warriors. The Rabbitohs are their only shared opposition this year, um, and both sides defeated them without too much struggle, but the Warriors definitely did it a lot easier. The difference between their records being identical is the Warriors are actually on a three-game win streak now, and even in their opening losses to the Storm and the Sharks, they still show me plenty of character. Like, they, they had moments in those games. that they shown the sort of character, and they turned up enough that those are the games that, you know, you're competing. You're giving yourself every chance to win. And, yeah, they came up short, but I was still impressed there. Um, as it currently stands, the Manly Seagulls are making roughly more than four errors per game, and only the Titans are missing more tackles than Manly this year. So that's an area they'll definitely need to improve, particularly over in New Zealand where it's always a little bit wet um, and a little bit more difficult conditions than here in Australia. And I just think when they won last week against the Panthers winning, what they did so well their forward pack controlled the game. I really question whether their forward pack can match that intensity again against the Warriors forward pack that's going to be even stronger, you could argue. Uh, and the Warriors back three as well. Just incredible coming out of their own end between Montoya, Dallin, Wateni, Zuzniak, and Chan Zuko Klukstar. You can probably add RTS to that as well, the way he comes in for early hit-ups. So I think the Warriors should be able to steamroll them in the middle there, which will definitely add uh, to their ability to win this game in my mind. What about yourself? Any final thoughts on this one? Yeah, let me respond to The Undertaker. I've got to give the man a shout-out because he's shared play of the week and five weeks in, he is undefeated 5-0. and Undertaker, remind us who you like in round six because we've got to pay attention to that. He mentions that Manly and the Warriors are very close to even in his mind, so he can't get to a Warriors minus six. But I would say to you, Undertaker, is that including with Garrick out? Like, DWZ's back for New Zealand. But with no Garrick, like that's one of your star outside backs and your goal kicker. I think New Zealand are the clear better side by a couple of points, but maybe that difference of opinion. The Undertaker also asks, what's the Warriors' best win? Well, I don't know if the Warriors have put it all together. Like you can only do, you can only be who's in front of you. So they won by 30 last week, looked great. But yes, if you want to dismiss it because it was South, okay, then, then a win over Newcastle and Canberra, who are both like gritty teams that made the Warriors earn it. And look, they had 99% of a win over Melbourne in Melbourne too. Like it takes the greatest try we've ever seen to close a match, to beat them there. So, uh, and, and they were close against Cronulla too. So I find it more challenging to really pick New Zealand apart. I see a lot more to like. Uh, a few other housekeeping parts, Clarky. I've missed Nicole's bet. He's back with us this week and had a bet for Friday. And I think you also missed just the better SGM segment. Is that right? So what I might do is play Nicole's clip and then we can remind people too, uh, as well as a couple of our best bets being on better, that we will have my SGM after going perilously close last week. Uh, that'll be for the Finns Broncos games. But but Nicole's tip is going to be for Storm Bulldogs. Hey everyone, it's Nicole from Wiki. Hope you guys are doing well on this cold, wet, and miserable Tuesday. Jerome Hughes is coming up against the Bulldogs. They've named a couple of their players out, and I reckon a couple more are almost definitely going to be ruled out, including Viliami Kikau, who's a left side back rower that he'll be running at, and I reckon they'll have a rookie named there. Anyways, Jerome Hughes is $3.30, guys, on Bet365. 
five. He's less than three dollars according to our model. His career strike rate and a couple of the other bookies that have try score markets out. As always, guys, Google Wiki Link Tree. Uh, Discord's about to hit 4K. I've got it. Two of the five, two out of three, ain't bad. Um, correct on uh, with Toppy so far. It's been a it's a bit of fun start to the season. ROI is where we wanted the where we want it to be. We just need a couple of big odds try scores to get up and hopefully that's this round. Good luck, punt responsibly. Thank you very much to Nicole there. I like that a lot, actually. It's a, a really great tip there. As he said, Google Wiki Link Tree to see their odds comparison tool for try scorers and everything. And my apologies for forgetting my cue for Friday night, guys. So don't forget for the Friday night footy, it also means an exclusive better same game multi crafted by Winnie himself. This market profited 20 units in 2023. And whilst we are yet to hit this season, we're getting closer with Winnie's pick falling half a try short last week in the Newcastle game. Better also provides for that further NRL talk and tips in the Fox League lab, which you can check out on their YouTube channel each Wednesday. And always importantly think, is this a bet you really want to place for free and confidential advice? Call the number or visit the website in the show description. My apologies to our viewers then for missing that. Let's move back to this Seagulls and uh, Warriors game. And that is a point I had as well, Winnie, that if it is a tight contest, missing Ruben Garrett could hurt Manly. Um, I did see the Undertaker roll through another comment in response to your question. He said that Garrick doesn't move the needle for him because DC is a goal kicker. And to answer Undertaker's question of what's the Warriors' best win this year, I think if it was Seagulls versus Knights this round, I'm tipping Knights. And I think if it was Seagulls versus Raiders, I'm tipping Raiders. Would, would you agree with that or disagree? I disagree with that. Like, I don't want to completely write off Manly. It, of course, it depends, like, where these games took place. Like, Raiders and Knights are stronger yep. propositions at home uh, as opposed to away. And New Zealand did catch them both at Mount Smart. So it definitely ch- shifted the scales into um, New Zealand's favour. But, you know, there's different opinions there. Like, Matt Potter points out, New Zealand should be 5-0. and oh. And, like, I get that argument too because they're up 12-0 against Cronulla. And the thing is, if New Zealand gets one more try there, like, they were, it was a stampede early, and that was the opening game of the season. I feel like New Zealand would have run away with it. Then we mentioned the other loss being the Storm game that was, you know, all but put to bed. So, yeah, and I've seen people writing that, like, Luke says, these are both top four-level teams, you know. So there's, like, reasons why people can pick both sides apart, but also reasons why they could both uh, argue these are contenders uh and i know like yourself you put up a bit of a contenders tier and you probably um uh, yet to um <clears throat> you know anoint the seagulls in that vein yet but should they go over and win in new zealand then you definitely reevaluate that one so for me i think the warriors will win it comfortably and i was confident enough to play it as a best bet yeah, I agree that I've got Warriors winning comfortably here. Um, I also expect that both Warriors wingers are a live chance to score. I think that's an area where they're much stronger than the Seagulls. Um, of course, Montoya and Dallin Martinez Lesniak versus Jackson Parlow and Tommy Talao in those matchups there. Let's move to the next Saturday afternoon game. It's the Eels v Cowboys at Combank Stadium, and the line is set at minus three and a half in the Cowboys' favour. For the Eels, Blaze Talonghi has been dropped. Dejan Arcee moves to 5 8 and partners Dylan Brown in the halves. Mike Acevo has been dropped, so that moves Bailey Simonson to the wing and Morgan Harper returns at centre and Bryce Cartwright is back at back row, which forces Wiramu Greg out of the side. For the Cowboys, just the one change, Tom Chester comes in at centre for Zach Laybutt. Winnie, it has been nine, almost ten years since the Cowboys won a game in Parramatta. It's Scott Drinkwater's 100th NRL game. Do you think the milestone game here could change their fortunes in the west of Sydney? You do typically see teams get up for big players' uh, milestones. It's not a bad time to catch Parramatta. Like I mentioned about Penrith, uh, this team is missing a very influential halfback as well, and the Eels were shocking in Canberra, and I mentioned that that was costly for the uh, tips results. And the attitude is just as concerning, like the ability to not be able to cover for Moses at all and clearly just in the cycle of games. Uh, being second best, not being able to kick and uh, and cover it the way that they want to, but also defensively. Like, Moses isn't the one that's there making all the tackles. So I worry about attitude, but I would give the Eels one more shot. Like, I wouldn't write off Parra. I talked about your contender, what would you call it, power rankings, tiers. I yep. uh, saw you copying a bit of flack. You know, you haven't elevated Manly and they just beat Penrith. 
and you haven't really demoted Parramatta yet. And maybe that's because in your mind you're still calling Para a possible contender because Moses will come back into the team. In any case, I saw you copying it, but you were copying it from literally Eels fans saying, mate, you don't know our team. Like I've put a line through them myself. This was Para fans saying it about their own team. I won't do the same. I won't write off Parramatta. This would be a good opportunity for a response. However, if Para can't show up for this one, then you would be really worried. Uh, Kyle Gordon says, give me whatever Brad Arthur is smoking. Blaze struggled in two starts at 5 8, looked promising in his debut at centre, deserves another crack, but they've opted for Morgan Harper. Like, I couldn't agree more. I thought the logic is okay, the halves combination hasn't worked, but Talangi's a perfectly good outside back in a team that has. Uh, missed you know strike power in their outside backs and and Arthur swung the axe in fact Sivo has gone right uh, and, and so is Wiramu Greg so for those who are following that Winnie's Kitchen trend which has hit already twice this year of the player I tip in my Winnie's Kitchen multi doesn't score and then the following week gets a double it's already happened with Sam Walker and uh, Solomon Fatape you don't get the chance with Blaze because he doesn't get a start this week uh so I think the power could get up for this, but the line's not doing me any great favours. I'm not getting an outstanding line value that I think I'm going to play Parramatta. And I know that the Cowboys are an exciting team that I don't really want to get out in front of. I thought North Queensland was nothing special. You know, mediocre in the win over the Titans and had some nervous moments towards the end. But the worst thing that comes out of that game is the loss of Labor. Uh, I'm not convinced about Chester. I feel like the one thing to be small and nippy as a fullback, but can you have a small body centre? I know he did play in the Dragons win, uh, but the Cowboys are a dangerous side if you're not fully focused. So that's the key is what response can Arthur get out of his troops because you can have one bad game, but that's two now. Losing on that Monday to the Tigers, being second best there, and then just way off the pace from the jump down in Canberra. So this is going to be really telling about Parramatta uh, this year for me. I didn't quite, I didn't quite weigh in on either side of it, uh, but I'll be very interested in how it plays out. From a betting perspective, I agree that line does absolutely nothing for me. You have a side who lost by 35 points and a side that won by 13 points but was winning by 20-plus until they had to play a sin bin, which changed the game. From a footy perspective, Winnie, I had a take this week, and I said the Eels cannot persist with Dylan Brown at seven. It's taking away from his best football when controlling the left edge. The Eels attackers look stagnant and failed to threaten these past two games without a genuine six or seven. At least moving Brown back to six solves one of those issues. Instead, they name another 5'8 alongside him again, which I thought was crazy given they have a very young, promising halfback in Ethan Sanders, who by all reports they desperately want to keep. Seemed like a good time to give an opportunity. Uh, but alas, the Eels are a completely different side without Mitchell Moses in the two games we've seen. The one-point loss to the Tigers, ultimately you look back on that game and they just blew a ton of opportunity. Their attack was nowhere near the standard that was required. But we fast forward a week and nothing improved against the Raiders. I'd go as far to say it regressed. Like, I know the Raiders are better defensively than the Tigers, but their attack got worse, I believe. Without Mitchell Moses, they are averaging half the points they were with him in the first three games this season. Um, and that includes, like, you know, games against the Panthers and, and tougher competition. So the Eels are really struggling for points, whereas we know the Cowboys are dominant in that area. And when you're struggling for points, and if the Cowboys get points on top of you early, I know that that's going to add some scoreboard pressure to the Eels who won't be completing their sets and playing their natural style. Um, they do also, the Cowboys this is, they average the most post-contact meters of any side this year. And I think some of the Eels forwards have been a little bit down on form as well. Um, the Cowboys are also averaging 31 points per game, which is a league high. So they're very dominant in these attacking stats. Defense is not an area of concern for me either. Statistically, the Cowboys average less missed tackles, uh, even though they have a lower completion rate than the Eels. So there's more defense required in that. What's your final thoughts on this one and anything jumping out at you at all? Cam Smith, the one of the greatest to ever do it, comments, I believe there's a trend where teams play much better after a close win against sides at the bottom of the ladder, kind of like the good team off a bad loss trend. So to me, that is you just sneak by a lowly opposition. In this case, the candidate would be North Queensland 
unconvincing win, but do get the win against the Titans. And I definitely think that is a positive because you get all the positives of winning, but you don't get the ego, inflated ego from it because you can still review it and uh, look at all the areas where you need to be better. So I appreciate that trend. Like it's not a bad spot for the Cowboys. They still owe Parramatta revenge, really, when you consider that Parra took their their grand final spot in 2022. Uh, But I won't be surprised at all if the Eels get the upside here. The Cowboys are no sure thing for me. Uh, Parramatta still has enough to win with in this one too. Okay. For me, I'm going to go Cowboys. Um, I'm loving Scott Drinkwater's form this year. I think he'll be really dangerous down that left edge. It's also his 100th game, so I expect that the Cowboys will get up given he's an important part of their side. Um, I think that they'll just trouble the Eels a bit too much. They'll score too many points, and in turn, that'll pressure the Eels to make uncharacteristic errors trying to chase those points. Final game of Saturday night, it's the Rabbitohs v. Sharks at a core stadium, and the line is set at minus 8.5 in the Sharks' favour. Uh, Rabbitohs changes. Of course, Luttrell is out, so Jai Grave makes his debut. Tyron Munro is back from that collarbone injury. Uh, this is a really strange one for me. Peter Mamozello starts. Damien Cook's been dropped, or well, he's 18th man, as has Sean Kepi and Talis Duncan. That brings in Saliba Havili and Davey Mawali. No changes for the Sharks. Uh, Britain Nakora returns, rather, for the Sharks in the only change there. And the Rabbitohs are typically very good at home against the Sharks, Winnie. They've actually won their past seven in a row over Cronulla at Accor. But this is a very different south side to what we know in the past. Can you see any world where they get back on track in this one? Funnily enough, this was kind of one of those early signs uh, of the Rabbitohs' demise last year, if you recall, yeah, where this Perth. match took place in Perth. And it looked to be set up. Rabbitohs got all the rep players back after kind of a brutal uh, origin period where they got gutted both with injuries and all their players get picked for origin. Uh, and then Rabbitohs were strong favourites and I was on them in Perth. And if you can recall as well, the Sharks were in this like tailspin. They were in a spiral where they looked like they were going to miss the eight, but this was a turning point for both clubs because the Sharks got the surprise win and the Rabbitohs basically never recovered from this point. And once again, I thought to myself, oh, is eight and a half getting a bit rich with Stouts? But yeah, I was unconvinced that JD's kind of uh, lineup. We'll get to that. But my first thought was you make an argument for playing Souths this week because of injured player theory that Latrell is out, but I don't think people will disagree with me if I say that could boost the team because we know that there's issues with, I guess, I don't know, his leadership, his, his energy. You bring in a guy who's a, in New South Wales Cup and is going to be hungry. Tyrone Munro is an excitement machine as well, comes in on the wing. But I can't get around the other changes that JD's made, like Talis Duncan being dropped. Like oh, Havili was already dropped for form, but now you're going to bring Havili back in when you're going to drop like Kepi Cook out of the team altogether. I wasn't sure that he was one of the, the biggest issues, but I guess people have said, well, the axe has to fall on some big name players. To me, it's like Southall got the buy next week, right? It's the most logical time to kind of replace your coach. I think it is time to, to say farewell to Dimitri. And I think we've seen enough that it's almost an untenable position. But if JD knows it's his last possible chance, I feel like maybe not only does he need to win, but he needs to shake up the lineup because then should Souths get the upset, there's an argument that, well, like, all I need time to develop my new spine with Mama Zellos and and Gray and Hawkins. Uh, But who's really going to step up and and lead Souths to victory here? Because Murray is the most important player and he's playing busted. So there's so many reasons why Souths could underwhelm yet again. And then I look at Cronulla. They're off a buy. They're fresher. If anything, they've had issues with some forward pack injuries. Nakura was suspended, right? He's back and arguably the most influential forward. Hamlin Wele and Rudolph on the bench. Uh, sorry, on the reserves, but I feel like there's a fair chance one or both could join the team. I don't really factor in much home advantage, right? The Rabbitohs in an uninspiring season are not going to have many people cheering them on at a core. Uh, I, again, missed opportunity, didn't play against South last week, should have. I'm a big, big believer that you don't try and jump on a bet just because you wish you were on it a week ago. Every week is different, but I know I'm going to get a Canola side that comes with 80 minutes of effort. Like they found themselves down 18 0 against Canberra. So they also could um, look for lots of improvement in their bye week. And 
you you would say this is the ultimate spot where if the if the if the team wants JD to remain the coach, they must play for his job and they must win for him here. But what if he's already lost the locker room? So I think the extreme scenarios and margins are in play here. So I think that a Cronulla 40 plus, you know, what type long shot is a type of bet where if Cronulla's out to, you know, 14 nil, 16 nil, you're going to have no faith whatsoever that Souths will fight their way back into the game. So it's one where the extremes, um, in the statistics sense, I think we say that's a like a long tail on the uh, on the distribution. So I would I would probably have a little bit of a, a play at something like that. Yeah, and I mean, you look at last week when even the Rabbitohs scored first. Once the Warriors got back into the game, it was at that point where South had dropped. So then you start to ask the question, what sort of lead would you need that you feel comfortable that South will be in it for the full 80? You mentioned Jai Gray. He's been incredible in New South Wales Cup this year. Four games, three tries, three try assists, 25 tackle breaks, and he's averaging 164 metres. So that's the best attacking stats of any Rabbitohs player um, in their NRL side um, in the New South Wales Cup, of course. And when we look at this one, like, and we talk about sports betting, you know, you go against the grain, you look for that outside that no one else believes in, and you're looking for reasons as to why a team might be galvanized or that maybe they're set to suddenly turn up for their coach or a reason that there's just been this gradual buildup of pressure that finally explodes and it all clicks into gear for them. But the problem is for the Rabbitohs, I could come here on this show genuinely for the last 20 weeks almost and and repeat that script and there are reasons that I could do it, but the facts are they've only won five of those games, right? And now it seems Jason Demetrio is on his last legs, as you touched on, and you just wonder, do the players really care? Because if they did really care, they've had ample opportunity to prove as much. Last year to make finals, this year to start the year strong. Neither's occurred. The Sharks, now they are coming off an impressive win over the Raiders, particularly with what we saw from them last week. You know, we hold the Raiders in a little bit higher regard now. Um, and they're also fresh off a bye, which does not help the Rabbitohs at all. And for the Rabbitohs, if they even look forward one second of this game, they've got the Storm and the Panthers away. Like, they have to know that this is a very, very tough spot right now for the club. When the Rabbitohs are at their best, you know, they're chancing their arm, they're throwing the footy around, they're playing free. And this year they're completing at 73%. And that seems really poor. Until you look back to 2018, Winnie, that was the last time where they completed at 78%. They've not completed over 80% for a very long time. So even though they're still playing that style of footy that comes with the risks of errors, they're just not scoring the points. And I am happy that the Sharks have had a strong season besides dropping that one game to the Tigers, which was kind of bizarre. Uh, But I don't hold the Sharks any lower because of that. Because as you said, you're always prepared to give a quality side another chance when they have that one poor game. Any further thoughts from yourself on this one? I like Hamish's comment there that if you're backing the bunnies based on desperation, you play first half, can't see him holding on for the full 80s. I think yeah. that's very true. Like a line of eight and a half, if you if you like Souths, which I don't, so I'm not endorsing, but you would play Souths plus four and a half first half. And the logic is if Souths are down more than four, so if they're down six or more, you're really not going to be confident that they'll come back. It's all about the start for Souths. That's where we're going to see if they are willing to fight, you know, for the jersey and also for their current coach. But it could be a terrible spot, honestly, with the buy coming up. Uh, they could just be ready to have a break and they could they could check out earlier than uh, the 80th minute mark for sure. Definitely. And then, as, as I said there, after the buy, it doesn't get any easier with their next two. Um, you'd have to think, well, I, I'm going to go Sharks here, absolutely. Um, you, the the Rabbitohs are conceding 32 points per game. And the Sharks is averaging up there with the top points of any side in the league. You just you can't be averaging 32 against great attacking sides, with the Sharks, which the Sharks are. Um, and as far as try scorers, I'm going to stick with Ronaldo Molotalo, who has 10 tries in his past 10. So sorry, Bunny fans, but I don't think it gets any better this week. Sunday afternoon kicks off with the Tigers v. Dragons at Campbelltown Sports Stadium. And the line is set at minus one and a half in the Tigers' favour. However, John Bateman is out. So Alex Safarth moves to back row. Both Fainu brothers are out, so Justin Matamua and Asu Kiapoa join the bench. For the Dragons, Hame Sele is back, a big inclusion there. That moves Jack DeBellin to the bench, and Michael Molo drops out. One final point of the team list, Winnie. Watch Zach Lomax. There was reports earlier this week he'd be named at fullback. He wasn't, but Shane Flanagan could obviously switch him and Sloan. 
like he did halfway um, last week. Now, the Tigers did manage a big win last time at home when he was against the Sharks, who we just previewed there. However, that was Leichhardt Oval. This week, it's Campbelltown, where they've actually lost their last eight in a row. So do you think there are a chance to snap that streak here, or do you prefer the Dragons in this one? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's nothing against Campbelltown. They've lost all these games there. It's because they've really struggled. They've won the last two sprints, right? But West are a better team this year. They were the only side I could look to in this game. So I would tip West, and it's pretty simple. I think that they are the slightly better team, but it's not by much margin at all. Uh, you know, no Galvin there. And, of course, Bateman as well. Whereas the Dragons, you'd say, are full strength. So Campbelltown is an edge to the Tigers and, and maybe West will get will get a, a narrow victory just on the back of the craft of, of the likes of Happy Coruscant. Uh, could be the difference. But I didn't play West as a best bet because I couldn't really sit here and justify that the line should be, you know, much beyond the one and a half. Both these sides are off losses, so they both strive for improvement. But also importantly, both will really see the game as very winnable. And you rewind to towards the end of last year. This was the spoon bowl. This was two uh, clubs. I don't know about in disarray, but uh, you know, dishevelled and and down on their luck and playing out for who's going to come last. And this year, things are looking up a bit for both teams. Both have new coaches and both are playing a little bit better footy, albeit. Inconsistent, but inconsistency is what you expect from kind of bottom eight sides. But when there's a good chance for a win on offer, as there is for both these sides on Sunday and in the Channel Nine game, no less, uh, they should both give a good account of themselves. In fact, as I say that, the the Magic Round game, which I was in person for last year, springs to mind, and that came right down to the wire. Who was it? The Dragons botching the win at the very end, wasn't it? Remember, Ben Hunt put the grubber in behind, regathered it. They swung it to the right and somebody like Tyrell Sloan thought a triple cutout was the move and, and the Dragons found a way to blow it. But, yeah, this game could could equally go down to the wire. I look at this game and I don't think it's going to be like a classic game of footy. I think it's either going to be a super high-scoring contest where both sides display their attack or super low where both sides turn up with defence. And I, I know that's a, a weird prediction. I'm kind of playing both sides of the coin there. So if I had to prefer... I think this would be a low scorer. Um, I don't see anything in the middle. I think it'll just be either a complete blowout or a really weird low scoring game. Um, and I do expect this one to be very close. These sides are separated in set completions where the Tigers are at 82%. That's the fourth best in the league. The Dragons are the second worst at 74.5%. That being said, when we go to the defense side of things, you more or less flip their positions around given give or take one or two spots in that regard. So, it's a, it, again, it's a coin flip. I mean, the market kind of dictates that as well. Here's the thing about the Dragons. Yes, they did make an insane 18 errors last round, but I can forgive them for that. It was really tough playing conditions. When these sides met last year, the Dragons won by four points on one occasion and the Tigers won by two points. Both games were low scoring with the unders paying. What would your thoughts be on this play here, Winnie, from a betting angle? Uh, I remember it was the Bronco Storm. You showed me the try bet where it's kind of like either side to win 1 to 12. So going back to 2017, only twice in that time has either of these sides won 13 plus against each other. Every other game has been close 1 to 12. Do you like that angle at all here? It's most likely. It's going to be paying like $1.60, $1.65. Oh, okay. uh, but... It's a good bet probably if you lean to unders and you've kind of had a bet each way there and saying like, you know, points can lead to points, but also I suppose that the Tigers are missing one of their biggest weapons in Galvin that a few people are commenting that that, that could cost them the win. Uh, and the Dragons are not traditionally a super high scoring side. If they want to win, their defense has got to be on point. But for a close to double up odds, you'd certainly get, uh, you know, you could get maybe dollar eighty either one to ten, or you know you get you get plus money for either one to eight. And if you can't split the sides, uh, I definitely think both should show up, and that wouldn't be a bad play. Yeah, and the reason why I kind of mentioned that as an angle that I'm leaning at on this one is the Dragons have mixed their form horribly this year, but I do think they have greater potential under Shane Flanagan, and I have them in a touch higher form this year than the Tigers. So for that reason, I kind of see the Dragons. Uh, getting out to a nice lead, but we've seen the Tigers in the last three weeks. They do fight for the full 80, so it won't be over at that point. But I'm going to go the Dragons on trust here. 
but there's not much trust there because they have mixed their form horribly this season. Final game of the round. This one will see me out of the recap show. I apologize. Uh, call me a part-timer. Call me casual. But it's Sunday night. It's the Raiders v. Titans. We're at GIO Stadium here in Canberra, and the line is set at minus. Well, I've got 10.5 here on my notes, Winnie, and then when I did the graphics an hour later, it was in 8.5. So there has been a move there. Um, which is... Let me have a look, though, because I think I think it's both, depending on where you look. Uh, yeah, okay. So the best bet was plus 10.5, which I believe was with uh, better. Yes. Um, but you can carry on. But I'll look, I'll look elsewhere and see where the line's sitting now. Perfect. And for the Raiders, they've got Jordan Rappin around. So that allows young, exciting debutante Chevy Stewart to come in. Zach Hosking's back on deck for them, so that moves Arthur Mariotta to the bench. Corey Horsburgh is out, but exciting young gun Trey Mooney comes in. For the Titans, just the one change here. Isaac Liu returns with Joe Simpson dropping out of the 17. Uh, did you have the line there available? Everywhere that I've seen so far is nine and a half, and I want to check better itself whether we've, whether we've actually you know, had any influence on the market. Uh or if it was just, you know, a split line, bringing it up. Yeah. It's down to nine and a half as well. So okay. we did. We got people betting on the ugliest duckling of the week, and it is into a single-digit line. I felt like that was more appropriate, but that's the great thing about the pod too. And believe me, I get people's feedback, and people do not agree with everything I say. But if you strongly disagree with me, I've just moved a line from ten and a half to nine and a half. So you might really like playing the other way and playing that Raiders single-digit line. And there's lots to like about Canberra. Geez, they played with that great, you know, speed and aggression and ability to promote the footy and to utilise some of those explosive outside backs they've got, Schiller, Savage, Timoko. That's why it's tough to go against Canberra at home. And it's a team that's turned into 13-plus kings this year. After last year, could not get separation in a single game. But my question would be, is this team really that different or have we got a smaller sample size this year? Like I, I could I could buy that Canberra are improved, but for me it's another side where I'm not willing to say that suddenly vaulted to being a contender. The truth of the matter is that the Titans do come in a desperate side. They're not bottom of the ladder, but they are the only team without a win registered in 2024. But not a dead team yet for me. Like we know that in terms of the hopes for the season were really crushed when you lost a couple of games you should have won. You lost them both kind of by 20 or 30 points and you lost your captain, Tino, right? But since then, you did get back two genuine star players in Campbell and David Feeder, And there's still, you know, 20 rounds to go. And that's not to say that, that the Titans can make a push to make the finals, which was my prediction earlier in the year. But it is to say you don't just mail in the next 20 weeks. Like, it's still important for the players to prove themselves to get their spot and for Dez to start to turn the club around. So I am here to say the Titans are not a total uh, basket case, and that's not me stubbornly clinging to my preseason prediction. Like, I was willing to give the Gold Coast away last week. It's lucky I didn't play against them with the line because they actually covered. But for me, the trip down to Canberra is not as daunting as the trip north that the Titans just made. Foreign named, but I'm not even really factoring that in as a positive because... He either gets withdrawn or he gets injured every game. I'm sorry to say. I'm excited to see what Chevy Stewart does. Hosking's a big in for sure. But the Titans aren't – the Titans roster is just not holes apart from Canberra. When you've got the likes of JC and Fafita, players that can actually change a game, break a game open, give you enough to be in the contest, I do believe this one will be closer than expected. Yeah, it's, oh, I, I see. I've just lost all faith in the Titans, and I'm not sure if that's from a betting perspective or just as a passionate fan perspective. But uh, I can look at the top sport line as well. That has moved to nine and a half. The Raiders have won eight of their past nine against us. I've been at a lot of those at Canberra. I can't remember the last time we won, but I was on the Fox League um, television afterwards actually high-fiving the players. The fact that I can't remember, it's probably not a good indication of how recent it was, uh, if I'm absolutely honest. Now, this is where it gets really concerning from a statistical perspective here. The Titans have conceded 28 or more points in their past nine games consecutively. That is an all-time NRL record. They are the first team to concede 28 or more nine games in a row. And this Raiders side has shown us this year their attack is improved. They're averaging 27 points per game. 
Titans are averaging 28 points conceded. You can see that the math is starting to line up here. All three of the Raiders' wins this year have come at a margin, at an average margin rather, of 24. And when we look at this Titans side, outside of a period where Chad Townsend was sin binned last weekend, they only have six tries all season. Now, Jamal Fogarty, um, if people aren't aware, he was a former Titan. He was a captain of our club, and we chose a young halfback, Toby Sexton, over him, who we've now moved on from the club. Jamal Fogarty is in great form this year. I've got no doubt on a personal level he will feel disrespected with what happened. He will circle this game, and emotionally he will turn up for this one. Additionally, the Titans, I thought they looked thin on a quality middle forward against the Cowboys with that Tino, and the Raiders are averaging the second most post-contract meters of any side in the competition. So their forward pack for me absolutely has the ability to really bully the Titans in this one and just dominate in the middle there. Uh, what's your final say, Winnie? Any comments jumping out or anything else you'd like to add to this one? Look, not surprisingly, there's not much support in the comments. There's plenty of people that will go the other way, and I think it's really easy to uh, talk yourself into Canberra, and I certainly can't sit here and say there's no way that Canberra blows out the Titans because it's a very real possibility, but it goes back down to like what what should, what should would you make the line and uh, how bad are the Titans really, as well as how good are the Raiders? Because I think a lot of people see Canberra, who may very well after this game be four and two and, and be close to top four, definitely see Canberra as a finals footy side and see the Titans as spooners. And I think neither one may end up being true. They could be closer on the ladder than that. And uh, Sunday will be a good litmus test. And the Titans have a strong enough side to go down and, and compete, as I said before. Let me ask you this. So I can get a first half handicap of plus four and a half for the Titans. That's on top sport at the moment. Given we know the Titans struggle in the second half, do you do you like that angle as well? Or what kind of made you go the overall handicap line for this one? The Titans struggle in first half as well, don't they? I mean, they're down 16 <laughs> well, nil last year with we Queensland first... and actually, actually won the second half last week. Yeah. What were you but that's, that was an outlier, Winnie, because last year we actually led the competition in round one. Like if, if games stopped at halftime, we would have finished first. Um, we are very <laughs> poor in the second half. Yes. We have been for a while. I think the Townsville game was more of an outlier. Yeah, and that's the funny thing. Like last year still counts for something to me. Like the Titans blew a lot of games last year. Uh, the Raiders were the opposite. They found a way to win so many close games. And neither of these teams are dramatically different from last year. Like, if, like okay, yeah, it's a different coach. Uh, the Titans, but is Dez like, have we seen enough footy that we're suddenly saying Dez is a massive downgrade over Holbrook? Like, I'm not willing to go that far. I can understand there's, there's teething issues with a new coach. It's gone like way beyond what I would have predicted. And, you know, and I've um, faced up to that and paid the price with some betting results. And as for Canberra, like, why are they so much better? Like, was, uh, was White in some sort of locker room? issue you know he, he left funnily enough as it's mentioned in the comments left to win a premiership and uh is on the side that currently does uh sit in bottom of the ladder but it's exciting to have young exciting players coming through but the consistency is what i will be looking for for canberra this is a good opportunity to prove it to reinforce it and after you get a, a good win against a respected opponent like para you don't want to waste it by losing or, or being disappointing against the side that everyone expects you to beat. But it's still not that easy to turn up every week and dominate. So I'll challenge Canberra. You know, that that's still a side that, that gave up 30 straight points two weeks ago as well. So they've got their shortcomings just as much. Uh, well, not just as much, but I'm catching a double-digit line and I knew it would be unpopular and that's okay with me. And I did have a look. The plus six and a half uh, first half alternate line for Titans gets down to a dollar sixty-seven, so we can't offer that as a tip. It needs to be a dollar eighty or more. But for me to wrap up this one, um, unfortunately, please don't clip this. I do have the Raiders. They are simply just levels above us on paper and form. I think they should be more than enough to contain us and win pretty well here. Unfortunately, even though we'll still be there, loud and proud. But that is it. That will wrap up the show here, Winnie. We want to say thank you so much to everyone. We really appreciate your time here. This went a little bit longer than what we usually do. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we look forward to welcoming you back on the recap show live within 15 minutes of the final game every Sunday. I will hand the reins over to you, Winnie, to farewell the show. 
we rejigged the structure a tiny bit and maybe we've got to refine that now because we've gone a full 75 minutes. So hopefully there was some good stuff in there. We appreciate everyone that did tune in with us, whether it was live or whether you're catching this sometime after the event. But have a great week, guys, and good luck with your punts, whether you're backing mine or you got your own. As always, I'm all ears in the comments too. Uh, and we'll see you all Sunday to recap it, which will be just minutes after these Titans have played with Clarkie in attendance to cheer them on. So even if they're down 16 late, Clarkie, you don't let them give up, all right? Thanks, everybody. Legs.